Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. Um, first I'll start with a couple of announcements. I hope you all had a great 4th of July holiday and also that you didn't eat anything I wouldn't eat. Remember that was my um, parting comment on uh, the Thursday before the 4th uh, was to make sure you didn't eat anything I wouldn't have eaten and I'm sure you were all good about all that stuff, right? Okay, so announcements. Um, believe it or not, it's early July but we have to start planning for fall. And we have some great things coming up. Um, some of you know about our incredible diet and lifestyle intervention course where you can get 39 CMEs if you're a doctor, 39 C CEs if you're a dietitian or nurse. And um, it's a, admittedly a little pricey course, but we're offering a version of it that doesn't involve the celebrity instructors, but involves all the same material uh, for about half the price. And we've packaged it up with the chef certification course, the food over medicine certification course, and the business training for health professionals into one package that saves you like $1,500. So we're trying to package these things up so that those of you who are hungry for information, you know who I'm talking about, those of you who say, Dr. Pam, I want to learn it all. Okay. Okay, so if you're one of those people who wants to learn it all, we've got a great package for you this fall. So if you want to talk about it, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com and I'll send you some stuff. We can even set up a time to talk and about how to apply it in practice and all that sort of thing. All right, I have a couple great topics to talk about today. And we'll just start with you can add loss of cognitive function to the list of conditions that is related to being overweight or obese according to a new study. Now, here is the thing. Obesity leads to increased pulse wave velocity. Now, you may not be familiar with that term, but this is a measurement for arterial stiffness. Carotid intima media thickness, that means the thickening or the closing off of the artery. Um, those are markers for atherosclerosis that are also linked to cognitive decline as people age. And pulse wave velocity is also associated with increased amyloid deposition in the brain. That's a marker for Alzheimer's disease. You probably have heard about that. Well, the researchers analyzed data from over 1,200 subjects who were between 60 and 64 years of age who were enrolled in a long-term study. And the data had included body mass index, aortic pulse wave velocity, aortic calcification, and carotid intima media thickening. We'll call that IMT from now on for all participants at age 36, 43, 53, and then that 60 to 64 age group. Researchers had access to the results from a word recall test that was administered at the patient's last follow-up. Now they divided them into groups based on BMI, and that's all in the article. I'm not going to recite all of that to you. But two of the categories included um, somebody who became obese or overweight and then dropped out and didn't regain their, their weight, and then somebody who became obese or overweight, lost some weight and then regained, and then we had people who got overweight or obese early, maintained it for the whole study period versus those who uh, became overweight later. So here were the results. At age 60 to 64, this isn't surprising, the overweight and obese subjects had increased blood pressure, increased cholesterol, and hemoglobin A1C. That's a marker for diabetes. They also had higher carotid IMT, we'll call it for now, uh, aortic pulse wave velocity and aortic calcium scores than the normal weight subjects. Subjects with higher BMI scored worse on the word recall test after adjusting for sex, heart rate, education, and systolic blood pressure and for pulse wave velocity, which means that BMI and aortic stiffness have a separate effect on memory. Now, I've been saying this for years, and so have many other people, like Dr. Neil Barnard in his book, Power of Foods for the Brain, where he talks about that, um, to a certain extent, cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease are related to heart disease and coronary artery function. The subjects who scored worst on the recall test were the ones who became overweight or obese at a younger age, at 36, and then continued to maintain their weight status throughout the entire course of the study. On the other hand, the subjects who uh, dropped a, a BMI category and then they stayed that way, they had similar memory and vascular function to normal weight subjects. Now, if they lost weight and then regained it, they went back into the impaired category. So you do not get, you don't get points for the weight loss if you gain it back. You've got to sustain that weight loss for it to benefit you, not just here, but with any other marker we might measure. The researchers reported that obesity had a cumulative effect and compared obesity years and the effect on memory to the effect of pack years in the cigarette business for cigarette smokers um, um, and lung cancer. So um, some more reasons to, uh, to really get serious about achieving and maintaining normal weight because I don't know about you, I can think of a lot of things I could tolerate in life, but not losing my mind and having no quality of life as I age is just not, it's not acceptable to me. 
hopefully keep the body in shape and the mind in shape. That's what I'm aiming for. You guys can let me know how I'm doing if you listen to these video clips every Tuesday and Thursday. All right, so now I want to talk about another thing. Men have access to medications for erectile dysfunction. Insurance companies generally pay for it. Several women's groups have complained that women should have equal access to medications for sexual dysfunction and also be reimbursed by insurance, and they just may get their way very soon. So even the score is a campaign or a group financed by Sprout Pharmaceuticals posted an online petition that got over 40,000 signatures. The group's website encourages women to write to Congress and share their stories and sign the petition demanding that the FDA approve this drug called flubanserin to treat low sexual desire in women. Now this is a strategy that the drug companies use often, uh, mobilizing consumers to put pressure on the FDA, and, and it works, it's very effective. Well, unlike Viagra, which deals with a hydraulic problem, the ability to sustain or maintain, uh, to achieve or maintain an erection, um, flubinserin addresses how sexual, addresses um, low sexual desire and acts on dopamine and serotonin receptors in the brain. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, that sounds an awful lot like an antidepressant, you'd be right, because because in fact, that's what the drug was developed for, and um, it was miserably uh, a failure in clinical studies, but some women said, hey, I don't feel you know, less depressed than I was, but um, things have gotten a little bit better in the bedroom. Well, accidental discoveries like this are really wonderful for the drug companies because it means that they haven't torched the research and development money, and they still might be able to salvage the drug and turn it into a billion dollar seller. But flavanserum has been rejected twice by the FDA due to very low efficacy and numerous side effects. A committee of outside advisors unanimously voted to not approve back in 2010. A new committee, though, recently recommended approval. And this time, uh, the phar Sprout Pharmaceuticals really had their machinery and gear to make it happen. So even the SCORE supporters packed the hearing room, giving the impression that low sexual desire in women was a major issue that needed to be solved. Now, uh, just as an aside, I have had a problem with this for years. In an FDA hearing, the only thing that should be going on is reviewing the science as it pertains to the benefits and side effects of the drugs. There really isn't any room for emotional pleas from consumers, but nonetheless, this, this is allowed, and, um, and it is very effective. In fact, uh, even the score is real familiar with it because Audrey Shepard, who heads that organization, used to be head of the Office of Women's Health at the FDA, and now she's a paid consultant to Sprout. So this is the revolving door thing where people who work for the drug companies go to work for the government and then they leave the government they go to work for the drug companies and they all know each other and it's just one big happy family down at the FDA headquarters with uh, the FDA and their drug company friends all right but I digress all right so recommendation for approval must have been the result of consumer pressure because the evidence was just not compelling in terms of benefit here is what this drug did it increased the number of sexually satisfying events that's what they call them for women by one per month um, had a very minor impact on self-reported sexual desire. In exchange for these minimal benefits, if you want to call them that, women are exposed to side effects that include low blood pressure, fainting, nausea, and dizziness, which increase in severity in response to drinking alcohol or taking oral contraceptives, which a lot of women do. It's hard to imagine that the women from even the score or the general public, if they actually understood this, would be so geeked up about this drug, but you know, the drug companies count on the fact that they can mobilize consumers who don't have a clue about this kind of thing. Um, I have a problem, and I think others do too, because I've read a lot about this issue online, about whether sac lack of sexual desire is a disease. I mean, there's just no end to the um, number of, of uh, conditions that the drug companies are willing to promote as diseases, but uh, it's not a problem for the people who stand to profit from it. They claim that the condition interferes with relationships and causes emotional distress for women. I love this quote from one guy. He says, our usual patient is someone who is fearful of losing the relationship they've been in for years. That's Dr. Erwin Goldstein, director of sexual medicine at Alvarado Hospital in San Diego. He's a consultant to the drug companies. Enthusiasm for drugs, yes. He says, it's tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. I mean, it, it's a little bit of a flair for the melodramatic, if you ask me. But in any case, this tragedy is worth some serious money. The original developer of the drug says that about 10% of all women 
suffer from low sexual desire. So if Sprout can get the drug approved, it'll be worth billions of dollars in annual sales. So Sprout will know in August if it hit the lottery, and uh, my guess is it probably will. I don't think there are many voices of reason left in federal agencies in Washington, D.C., so I'm sure lots of women are going to trade off their health for one sexual, satisfying sexual experience per month when uh, actually eating a better diet would probably be a much better idea. But there's no billions of dollars to be made doing that. Okay, that's all for today as usual. Pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.